Here at News Channel 13, we strive to tell accurate stories that are insightful, timely, and interesting. And although the way news is gathered has changed through the years, the importance of quality journalism has not. We now have a look at a day in the life of News Channel 13 back in 1979. We were CBS affiliate WAST at that time, and you might recognize some faces like former general manager Steve Baboulis, who was a producer at the time. You might also recognize former assistant news director and reporter Chris Bruner and former anchor Benita Zahn, who worked the assignment desk in 1979. Throughout the greater capital district, the day is just beginning. Commuters are taking area highways to work, and school buses are carrying students off to their classrooms. The last thing most of them are thinking about is what they'll be doing at 6 o'clock this evening. But for the 30 or so people who work here in the Channel 13 newsroom, 6 p.m. is very much on their minds each and every morning. Because by the time 6 p.m. rolls around, they will have had to find, report, and edit the day's local news events and put it all into a neat and concise package for the thousands of viewers who will tune in to find out what happened this day. The process behind this massive daily task begins with the assignment editor, Benita Zahn. It is her job to sort through all of the day's possible stories and decide which ones deserve coverage. Morning, Benita Zahn, 13 News. Anything going on? Um, can I talk to Division 2, please? Anybody there that I could talk to about the uh, Pinehills Rapist, if there's anything new? The story ideas themselves come from several sources. There is the day file, which contains news releases, notes on new and pending stories, and news conferences that have been scheduled. There are the teletypes, which pour out hundreds of stories each day from around the state and the world. There's also the phone, police and fire scanners, and of course the station's own reporters. After reviewing all of the possibilities, the assignment editor must then decide which stories are most likely to interest and inform the audience, which will be watching 10 hours from now at 6 p.m. Next, the assignment editor must team up reporters and photographers who will go out and cover the stories. And to keep track of everybody, a daily assignment log is filled out as well. Reporters also use pocket pagers and two-way radios to keep in touch with the newsroom. There's another story that you can pick up on your way back that Larry has already done. He did the beforehand to it, and it kind of came to a determination last night. So you don't have to worry about getting back for that 2 o'clock one. Unfortunately, news does not always occur when news people would like it to. And this morning is no different, as reporter Andrea Hall and photographer Jerry Lane are finding out. They were on their way to do a story on the Postal Service and its mail early for Christmas campaign when they were detoured to this house fire in Menads. This is the kind of story that is often toughest to do well, because you can only shoot it once. While the reporter tries to get the information that's needed, the photographer must get the pictures to go with that information. In television, pictures are as important as words. In fact, they are often more important. As the old proverb goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. However, for a television news photographer, getting pictures is not always easy. First off, although the equipment he uses is portable, it weighs 80 pounds. And it is expensive at a cost of some $50,000. Of course, not every reporter winds up having to run to fires. 13 News investigative reporter Robert Riggs, for one, often spends days or even weeks in the office getting the facts he needs for a story. Much of the information must be dug out of reams of public documents or come from confidential sources who are willing to talk. A source is almost like a road map to a story for you. It's a person who tells you where to look and what kind of documents to look for and, and uh, how to document whatever he's told you. But the important thing about it is to be able to assure them of confidentiality, that you will not reveal their name and you'll not put their name in your story or anything. If you do, then you're dead as an investigative reporter. Your sources will literally dry up. At mid-morning, the producer of the 6 o'clock news, Steve Baboulis, arrives at work. And he immediately checks in with the assignment editor to talk about the stories that will be in tonight's newscast. The way it stacks up. Sent Johnny B and Larry out early this morning up north to the Glensville Armory. They're testing up workers from General Electric who were working Hudson Falls and uh, Fort Edward area. Fort yeah, for PCBs. PCBs. That they dumped it in the water earlier a couple years back. Yeah. And that all hit today, so they're testing them. It's going on for three days, but I think it's best we get up there now. Um, As the elements of the newscast begin to shape up, the reporters continue their work in the field getting the stories. 
Larry Barr is interviewing GE workers in Glens Falls about the medical tests they're undergoing. Claudia Collins has stopped by the state capitol to do a quick story on the state's official Christmas tree. And reporter Chris Bruner and photographer Frank Cirillo have arrived at Capitol Newspapers in Colony. But they're doing a story on the paper's conversion of its delivery trucks from gasoline to propane fuel. Like any other story, the reporter and photographer must first get a quick idea what it's all about. And they must decide on how they will shoot the story. I don't think we'll bother trying to explain everything under the hood here, Frank, so don't get... Oh, no, I didn't mean that. I'm just don't get too particular with shooting each little gizmo I'm getting here because it's going to be too getting some B-roll. I figured we'd do everything in just one basic wide shot for yeah. a minute and a half. You know, the essential thing is that they're converting. We don't have to know the difference between... You almost have to be an expert on everything, and yet that's that's an impossible thing to be. Uh, I get up in the morning, I immediately read the whole newspaper from cover to cover. I watch practically every TV newscast I can afford the time to watch. Um, when I'm at a story, I don't stop talking when the camera goes off. I talk to the people who are there, I ask every little question I can, and I don't take that many notes. Um, which is odd for somebody who works in the journalism business. I try and put more of it in my head and try and get it sort of in my brain in a way that I can rewrite it again. If I can understand it in my head without having to take down a million notes, I think I can convey the ideas of a particular story to the audience a little easier. Could I have him kill the engine, please? That may be a little bit overpowering. Now it'll sound now we'll just like cross our fingers and hope that no airplanes land in the next five minutes. <laughs> we'll be all set. Anytime, Chris. All right. I think news is kind of a get it or forget it situation. A lot of times you're not working uh, in controlled situations uh, and you're usually winging it. What's the, the most satisfying thing about the job? Uh, I guess seeing your work on, uh, on the air uh, when you do a fine job and, uh, and seeing it. It's very, uh, very gratifying. The news crews try to get back every day around 3 p.m. so they can begin to write and edit their stories. Often that means catching a late lunch at the typewriter. Coffee. About the same time, the format meeting begins. This is where the 6 p.m. newscast is actually put together. The meeting includes anchorman Wilson Hall, 11 p.m. news producer Dan Foreman, 6 p.m. news producer Steve Baboulas, and news director Larry Price. All right, what are we going to lead with? Oh, we have a couple of choices, either um, the Iran stuff from today, because we have a good local lead. We could go with um, the GE testing for the PCBs. Or we could uh, or we go over what we've gathered during the course of the day and we decide which stories mm -hmm. we feel are most important, which should play higher in the newscast, which uh, should play lower. Uh, we decide on time budgets for each particular story and it's, it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle where you take the pieces and you fit them together and you come up with a newscast. So it might be a little tough to get it on for the top of the show. I think since we don't really have anything new about Iran, I feel a little bit... I agree. Okay, why don't we go with the Green Island? Right. Meanwhile, as reporters finish writing their stories, they move next to the editing booths. Here again, they team up with their photographer and begin piecing together the stories they have covered. Check, check, covered. check, 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 check. What are we calling this, baby? Uh, Saratoga Sheriff. Okay. You get the two of them. Okay. Yep. We go to some points now. This ticket is one of those given out because the driver had no permits. How What about the state? Do you CB picks up tubes, CB opens the door, 295. Channel 13 sports director Scott Murray is also at his desk by now. Using a separate sports teletype, he also is selecting the stories he will use on the air tonight. He also spends much of his time on the telephone checking local sports activities. Meanwhile, the format meeting is now broken up. Anchorman Wilson Hall is back in his office, checking each page of the script that he will read during tonight's newscast. Once the script is approved, the original and its five carbons are then separated. The yellow copy goes to the anchorman, the white to the teleprompter, the pink to the director, the green to the producer, and the orange to the Chiron operator, who is in charge of the machine that will superimpose names and information on the TV screen. Next, about an hour before the newscast is on the air, the director, Bob English, reviews the format of the show and marks down the studio camera shots that he will use. He also notes where video tapes will be played, and he pulls out whatever background slides are needed. Uh, I get the scripts at 5 o'clock and spend a full hour going over the script in my head and on paper. 
So that when the show, when the, we get down to the show time, I'm not surprised. Everything is coming along as well as can be expected according to the script. Uh, there may be some times when we have to switch pages or switch tapes, but this hour between five and six is the time when I should when I should uh, see those surprises before they happen. Next, as the reporters and photographers finish editing their stories, they are brought into the station's main videotape control room. Here they are transferred onto a master tape in the exact order they will run on the air. At the same time, each story is given a final check for any technical flaws. In the studio, preparations are also being made for the newscast. The studio is lit and the cameras are turned on and an engineer makes a daily check to make sure the cameras are perfectly color balanced, making any electronic adjustments that are necessary. Next, weatherman John Wolfe enters the studio. Using the latest forecast, he charts the weather systems and temperatures on the map. Oklahoma. About 20 minutes before airtime, anchorman Wilson Hall puts the finishing touches on his makeup. Then it's into the studio to make a final check of the script and go over any last minute changes with the director. Uh, sound on tape on page 11, right? And it's uh, wiped to a voiceover on 12, which is uh, exactly the police. Okay, yeah. got that one. And that Finally, the seconds tick off to 6 o'clock. Everyone is in position. And somehow, 10 hours of preparation comes together. For the next half hour, the viewer is hardly aware of the organized chaos behind the scenes. Sound on five. This is 13 News. Three ones. There we go. Here we go. With Wilson Hall. And Mike Q. Wilson. Good evening. The Island sites of auto sales are being felt by workers at the Green Island Four. Ford plant for the third in a series of layoffs was announced today. This latest round affects 250 workers who will work us one more week. The entire plant is slated to close on December 17th, idling 700 production workers. Ford officials say most of the workers will receive about 95% of their normal take-home pay through unemployment compensation and supplemental benefits from Ford Six, and from five, the United Arts. Four, three. Hi, who's this, Paul? <laughs> Listen, what's the story on Rudy and Ray's piece? Um, will continue. How much? They are being boosted by Seven economic minutes. Difficulties. Okay, we're going to have to flood. Okay. Collins, 13 News in Albany. Thank you. Rise against the devil, United States. That's a call from the militants holding the American embassy in Tehran to the rest of the Muslim world. The appeal comes in the wake of Iran's rejection of yesterday's United Nations resolution calling for the immediate release of the hostages. And as the hostage siege winds down its 32nd day, the United States continues to maneuver its warships in the waters near Iran. Here's a report on what those aggressive maneuvers Sound could mean. Four. Hi, Pappas, CBS News, Washington. Still to come on Early Edition, the safety rating of the state's bond issues drops a notch. Wilson, Wilson. One then, uh, out on one. Out on one. Art and all. Thanks to Oyster's electric slicer, you can... Okay. 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 An ice cream world. Yep. slicing action makes it doubly easy. Out on one. When we go to the voiceover, you'll be coming back on two. A local manufacturer is finding new ways to apply solar technology to new products. Today, Advanced Cooler Manufacturing of Clifton Park unveiled its latest invention. Back on two. Camera on two. Wilson Blue, camera one, weather two shot. Let's check the board here. Check the board, John. Okay. From solar energy to the sun, are we going to get any, John? Oh, we'll have a little sun tomorrow, but we're going to have extremely warm weather. Interesting, the pattern that's taking place right now, it looks like it'll continue. For the next three or four days, maybe right through the weekend. It's upper air, a jet stream which is moving north of us. All of these systems... They... There's a cold front associated with a low-pressure system over the Great Lakes, and it's all moving north of us. He's covered himself completely. Yeah, we might snow, we might see some sun, I don't know. Yeah. Look at that, that's just my... Over to two. Two's up. KC free agent Freddie Pontac is now a member of the California Angels. How about that move? Today he signed a three-year contract with Gene Autry's club. Well, our comment tonight concerns Chris Chambliss, the fact that Yankee fans across the nation are still the upset that he ever left New York in the first place. Well, let's face it. With Steinbrenner's payroll and the Yankees' need for a right-handed power hitter, there was really no alternative down in New York. Chambliss is a tradable commodity. Big rap. Okay, and you're out, Scott. 
Where do you cart? Right. Got him. Something on one. This summer's gasoline lines were more than just a big pain for motorists. For business enterprises, gas lines threatened their very existence. Down on TV saying, oh, come on, baby. Wah. Al Jagir is the operations director of the Capital Newspapers Group. During last summer's gas shortage, it was alarmed that the company's gas was cut 30%. Al's 29 vehicle fleet of newspaper delivery vans was in danger of running out of gas. No newspapers, no more business. So it was with great relief as the key was turned this afternoon on the first Capital newspaper truck to run on propane. Advantage? Propane is cheaper than gas, reduces air pollution and vehicle maintenance, and best of all, propane supplies were relatively stable during the gas crisis. Disadvantages? Slightly less miles per gallon. Five, four, three, two, one, out. Thank you for joining us. Coming up next, the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. Net and net. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Prices are around. I like the curve. Good evening. For the East West dispute. Finally, it seems that it's over. But for 13 News, this day is really only half finished. For tonight at 11 p.m., another newscast will go on the air as well. News Director Larry Price puts it this way. At the end of the day, when, when you, everybody you know, finally goes home, you, you kind of feel that, uh, you know, I've worked all day and it's gone. In a minute and a half or two minutes, it's gone. And you have to reconcile that with yourself that X number of people were able to see that story and appreciate it. But at the very end of the day, when you go home, it's a little bit like beating your head against the wall. It feels so good when you stop. And the news industry will continue to evolve as new technology is discovered and embraced. To see more coverage from years past at News Channel 13, head to our YouTube page. Opening News Vault 13, I'm Rachel Teedy.